Thank you for joining us online here at FAM Church as we conclude our series, Homefront. If you haven't already, please click the subscribe button below to subscribe to this YouTube channel and go out to Facebook at facebook.com slash famchurch and give us a like. And now our lead pastor, Brian Lane. And this morning is the final message in this series. And our topic this morning is the relationship between parents and children. So that's what that video was, the boy telling, listen, listen, Linda, because we've all been there and had conversations like that with our kids, those of us who've had kids, or a few, how many of us have been kids in this room? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, a few of you have. Uh, some of you were born full-sized adults. That's a little scary. I'd like to meet your mom. That's, but um, um, we're... we're we're gonna, that's what we're going to be talking about today. And if you've missed any of the previous messages, you can go to myfamchurch.com, click on our media tab, and uh, there's a little um, uh, graphic for Homefront, and you can find all of the messages there. But uh, if you have kids, you are someone's kid, or even if one day you are going to have kids, this message is for you. Because I believe that covers everyone in the room, right? Because all of us are somebody's kid. None of us were created from dust like Adam, right? Hopefully, no? Okay, good. All right, and, uh, and to prepare for this, I just want to lay a little bit of groundwork here. Okay, I'm going to be talking about parenting and parent-child relationships, but I want you to understand I am not speaking from a place of authority here where I'm saying this is how I do it, I've got it all together, Dana and I are the experts in parenting, learn from us, okay? Dana and I make as many mistakes, and my kids said amen, as, as the rest of you do when it comes to parenting, because it's hard and it's a challenge, and so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a text in the New Testament that talks about and addresses this issue, and we're going to pull some stuff from this text, okay? I am not claiming to be the expert on parenting. I am learning with you as I am doing this, as I am talking through this, as I am talking about what I learned in the text. And parenting is one of those interesting things, isn't it? I mean, everybody who's been a parent can say, man, that stuff is weird, that stuff is crazy, that stuff, it's hard to be a parent. And you know what? On a Sunday morning, if I really wanted to, every single Sunday in my messages, I could use an illustration of something that my kids did at home uh, throughout the week, and I would never run out of illustrations for messages. Because in life, in family, things are just crazy, and crazy stuff happens, but I don't do that because I don't want my kids to think, or my wife to think that everything they do, it's, oh, there's a sermon illustration for dad. Darn it. He's going to talk about us again. Okay? And so that's not where I want to be at. But this morning, I am going to use an illustration from our house. And it was from a long time ago. And I think it's one of Ashley's favorite stories in the world. Okay? But, uh, but when we first got into ministry and we, we started having kids, we were working at an inner city church in Boston, Massachusetts. And, and the deal at this church was uh, they didn't have much money, they didn't have much resources, but they had an apartment inside the church as part of our pay. So we stayed in this small 700 square foot apartment, the five of us and our cat. Okay, and now what you got to understand about this is this building was built in 1892 and it felt like it was built in 1892. Okay, in the winter time, when the winds blew, you could put your hands up against the wall and feel the cold air coming through. There was no insulation in the walls. And then because it had been built so long ago and there were so many holes in the foundation, we had regular rodent encounters, mice, rats, even squirrels in our apartment and in the building. One New Year's Eve day, I spent the morning chasing a squirrel in one of the rooms because it had somehow gotten in the building and our cat was stalking it and I had to get this squirrel out of here because... Our cat was probably going to get hurt, okay? And, and, so, and so, yeah, this, I mean, this was the place that we lived in. And the only reason we really had a cat was to keep the rats and mice out of the apartment and off the counters, okay? I mean, really. I mean, it, was, it was, I mean, when we were living there, I didn't think it was that bad. But now that I think about it, that was kind of rough. I remember one time, the fire, I'll just tell you random stories from Boston. One time the fire alarm went off. The fire department shows up. I was the only one there. And uh, so he wants to inspect the whole building. I take him downstairs into the, there was a bowling alley, candle pin bowling. Anybody from the Northeast know what candle pin bowling is? All right. Miss Rose knows. Okay, we got, all right, we got a couple more. Mark Shue. All right, but they had a couple of candle pin bowling lanes, and he wanted to inspect them. I opened the door to the candle pin bowling lanes, and there's like rats this big running down the, the, the bowling alley, and I'm just like, oh, I was so embarrassed. It's like, yeah, I live here. Got a problem with that? But anyways, 
One Sunday afternoon, uh, Dana and Caitlin had left the house, and so it was myself, Ashley, and Aaron in the apartment. And, uh, and what you got to know to make this story relevant is that at a park near our house, they had something on the playground, one of those little zip lines. Have you seen those little zip lines that you grab the handle? They're about 12 feet long, and you just kind of, you really don't zip. You got a more swing, and it, get, it gives your abs a workout more than anything else. But, you know, it wasn't one of these 600-foot zip lines that you see on TV, people zzz, you know, it wasn't one of those. It was just a small zip line. Well, my kids would play on that when we'd go to the park. Well, somehow we had inherited a double jump rope. This double jump rope was long. It was really long. I don't know. It, was, I, it seemed bigger than two jump ropes put together. But this jump rope was long enough to stretch from one end of my kid's room to the other. And so I'm there. I'm hanging out. It's a Sunday afternoon. I'm watching football. And all of a sudden, I hear some noise in the girl's bedroom. And so I go in there to find this double jump rope. One end is tied on the, the cross piece on the closet where you hang your clothes. The other was all the way across to the room, tied to the top handle on the dresser. And Ashley was standing on a chair in the closet with her hands on the jump rope like this. Okay? And so I came in there. And where was Erin in all of this? Well, she was l sitting down on the floor next to the dresser. Okay? In front of the dresser. And so I walked into the room. And I praised her creativity because this was brilliant. I got I to gotta admit, that was a brilliant plan, okay? But, but I let her know that this was a really bad plan because executing this plan, somebody was going to get hurt and the jump rope needed to come down. So she told me, okay. And uh, so I went out of the room and went back in to start watching football again. And uh, I listened for a couple of minutes. Things were quiet in there. So I just assumed that the jump rope was coming down or had come down. And so I get back into my football zone, and I'm watching the game. And then suddenly I hear, kaboom, and Aaron start to cry. Okay, I go into the room, and Ashley had actually tried to execute the zip line maneuver in her bedroom. As soon as she grabbed onto the rope and jumped off the chair, the dresser came down on top of Aaron. Okay, thankfully, thankfully, it only hit Aaron's hip and leg and foot, it didn't land on her head because a full dresser coming down on an 18-month-old head would be pretty, pretty intense. But, but that, that, was, that was Ashley's zipline experience, okay? And, and I tell you that because this illustrates a point. This shows what I want to explore between parents and kids because that's how it is, parents, isn't it? We tell our kids something, and what do they do? They don't do what we ask them to do. Meanwhile, kids, when our parents ask us or tell us to do something, we think they're idiots for telling us that, right? I mean, how stupid are they for telling us something like that? <laughs> yeah. I got one, one child into this. All right. But the place we need to start in talking about the parent-child relationships, the first thing that we have to understand is that it is foundationally different than any of these other relationships that we've looked at so far. It's different than a relationship between you and somebody you work with. It's different than a relationship between you and your next-door neighbor. It's even different between the relationship that you have with your wife, okay? It's completely different. You know, we can't go back into the Bible and find out where this relationship broke down, where sin had maybe entered into the picture, like we went back with Genesis and those other messages, okay? We just can't do that. That's not possible here because this is just something that was natural. It's how God created the world in which we live in for children to come out of moms and for them to be in relationships with their parents. Now, with that being said, sin is a key component in problems between parents and children, just like it is between husbands and wives or any other relationships. See, parents have sin that gets in the way of their relationship with their child. You know, their kid will do something, and the parent, before even considering anything else, just goes from zero to ten and is ready to, to pull out a belt and beat the butt off of their child, you know? And, and so, we, you know, we just get in, we don't even consider anything else. And then, so sin is in the picture. And children, you know, the children, there's sin in our kids, too. Now, those of you who have perfect children, I've just ruined your day by telling you that there is sin in your kids. But there is sin sin in your kids, okay? Don't pretend like there's not. But anyways, our kids, they know how to sin, and they know how to push our buttons as parents, right? They know how to tick us off. They know what to say and how to say it to get us so mad that we have the famous line from the once renowned but now maligned comedian Bill Cosby going through our head, I brought you into this world and I can take you out, okay? 
So this morning, we're going to go back to the letter to the Ephesians, which is where we were at two weeks ago when we talked about marriage. Uh, Ephesians is in the New Testament about halfway through. We're going to go through chapter 6 and look at verses 1 through 4. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, you don't know where Ephesians is, we got you covered. It's going to be on the screen behind me. If you're saying, man, I don't even, I don't even know what a Bible looks like, we got you at, guests, uh, at Fam Connections after service. If you want to go out there and just tell them you need a Bible, they'll put a brand new Bible in your hands uh, so that you can have that to read. Uh, and uh, so for those of you, though, who weren't here a couple weeks ago when we talked about this previously, I'm just going to do a brief bit of background information once again on the letter to Ephesians so that we are all on the same page. And this letter once again was written by a man named Paul, and it was written to the church uh, in the city of Ephesus in Asia Minor. And Paul was a Jew. He became a Christian. He converted to Christ, and God gave him the mandate to take the gospel to the Gentile world. That was anybody who was not Jewish. And so he was out there going through the whole Roman Empire, telling people about Jesus. And one of the cities he arrived at and actually planted a church at was the city of Ephesus. And uh, this city was a very wealthy city. It was a major trade port. Trade from the east and from the west met in Ephesus. And, and so goods went in and out of Ephesus. And, um, and it made it a very wealthy city because anywhere you've got trade coming from around the world, you're going to have lots of money. And so the, this city was very wealthy. It was very well-to-do, had lots of luxuries that a lot of other places didn't have. And the church was also a very big church. Okay, this church was one of the first mega churches that we know of in the world. It was big, and, uh, and a, lot, a lot of times when Paul wrote his letters, they were written to address problems and issues in the church, but when you look at the letter to the Ephesians, he really isn't addressing any sort of problems, situations, or circumstances here, and uh, he's just kind of writing about various topics, and so one of the issues he addresses in this letter is relationships within the family, and so with that, let's read verses 1 through 4 of chapter 6, and this is what it says. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. All right, so there are two pieces. There are two parts to the instruction that Paul gives. And the first instruction that he gives is to the children. Paul tells the children to obey their parents. And all the parents in the room say, okay. <laughs> but see, Paul is not telling them to obey their parents because he's trying to be hardcore, because he's trying to be a jerk, because he's trying to be mean to kids. He's saying this because it was something that God had said was important way back, almost at the, back at the beginning of time. Uh, what Paul says here, actually, part of these verses is actually a quote from the Old Testament. It's actually a quote from the Ten Commandments. Uh, the commandments are found in Exodus 20, 12, and Deuteronomy 5, 16. Uh, and where Paul is actually quoting from here is Deuteronomy 5, 16. And that verse tells us we are to honor our father and mother. And for most kids, this is kind of one of the, most bi the, one of the biggest challenges that I think they face in life. I know it was for me because when I got to 12 years old, obeying my father and mother was not one of my top priorities in my life, okay? I, I, I found it hard. I found it difficult. I had a hard time honoring my parents. I mean, just, just in some of the things, it was just like I had this curfew. I had to be in at midnight when I went out with my friends. I thought this was the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Every single one of my friends got to stay out till 1 or 2 in the morning. And here I am, the chump that had to be in at midnight. So how did I overcome this? I didn't go home at midnight. Okay? That was basically how I dealt with this. I didn't care that my mom and dad said you need to be in at midnight. I wasn't going to be in at midnight. I was going out. I was staying out with my friends. Because who wants to go to their friends and say, oh, mommy and daddy say I have to be home. Okay, no teenager wants to tell their friends that. My friends didn't want to take me home, and I didn't want to leave and miss all the fun. I had serious hashtag FOMO, the fear of missing out. So instead, I chose to disobey a command from God. But see, there's a reason that God says to honor your father and mother, kids. It's because God wants our life to prosper. 
See, God knows there are some key elements that we need to have in our life for us to prosper. And when I'm saying prosper, I'm not talking about you're going to have lots of money, okay? I'm talking about you're going to have a good, healthy, long life. Paul is telling us, God is telling us that if we want to prosper in this life, one of the key elements that we need in place to see that happen is to obey and honor our father and mother. And if we do that, things will go well with us and we may enjoy long life here on the earth. Now you may be saying, how does obeying our parents make us prosper? Because all that seems to do is, is, is help our parents out. It doesn't really seem to help us out. Well, the first way that it's going to go good for you and you're going to prosper is your parents will not want you dead, okay? Let's just be real here, okay? You know, your parents aren't going to constantly be at your throat. If you're honoring them, they're not going to be watching you. They're not going to be suspicious of everything you do. They're not going to be wanting to to look inside your phone and make sure that you're sending right text messages. They're not going to want to check your computer browsing history. They're not going to want to say no all of the time. They're not going to say, should I trust them? Should I believe them? Are they really going where they're going? If you honor your father and mother, you get a lot less no's in your life. Or you can't do that in the vocabulary, okay? That is one of the ways that it goes well with you when you honor your father and mother. But it's more than that, okay? Generally, when a parent tells you something, that it's not a good idea to do something, they want you to do something, or says no about something, you got to understand something, kids. Parents have a lot more experience in life than you do, okay? I know that's not something you want to hear. I know that you want to believe that you are smarter than somebody who's lived 40, 50, 60 years. But you got to understand, before they got to 40, they were 14, 15, 16, okay? Your parent has been where you are at. They have been a teenager. They have experienced life as a teenager. They know stupid decisions that you make as a teenager. And they are there trying to help you avoid making stupid decisions. I mean, I was talking, I was talking to Jason Hathaway this week in the office. He was talking to several of us. And we got on the subject of him, his daughter, dating somebody in the military. And he's like, my daughter will never date someone in the military. Why did he say that? Because he, mil- he was in the military. He experienced that. And he's like, that's not for my kid. Okay? I mean, that's, we got experiences as parents. We've been through things. We've made bad decisions. I mean, when my parents told me to be in at midnight, there was a reason for that. They knew that nothing good really happened after midnight. <laughs> they knew firsthand that all you do is get in trouble when you are out after midnight. Okay, and when I got in trouble with the police when I was 15, guess what time it was? It was 2 a.m., okay? This didn't happen at 6 p.m. I mean, we wouldn't have done it if somebody said, hey, let's go do this at 6 o'clock at night. We'd look at it, you're an idiot. No, 2 a.m., nobody's up, nobody's out. Parents tell you no because they know, because they have been there, because they've experienced that, and they're doing what they can to help you avoid unnecessary complications in your life. But when we don't listen to them, that's when things typically don't go well for us. Now, I will say this. If your parents are asking you to do things that you know are wrong, that God has said not to do, that is a case where you do not need to obey. All right, if your mom tells you that you need money for the electric bill, and so go down and rob the shell station on the corner, you don't have to obey that, okay? It's not, you know, mom says, we need some money, go sell crack to the neighbors. You don't have to do that, okay? That is sin. God doesn't want us doing that. You only need to obey something if it's not a sin, if it's not wrong. And so, here's the bad news in that. Cleaning your room is not a sin. Just putting it out there, all right? Missing the Justin Bieber concert is not a sin, okay? Okay? And so many of the issues that parents and kids have can be boiled down to the kids not honoring, the kids not obeying their parents. But Paul is not just holding the kids to some sort of standard to maintain the relationship. He also addresses the fathers here. Now, I know that the text says fathers, but there is a reason 
that he only addresses the fathers here, and it's not because the father is the only one with a level head between the two parents, you know. You got, you, you got mom, she's a little crazy, and so uh, just give these instructions to dads. <laughs> I, so many people think that, don't they? You know, mom's a little crazy. You got to watch out for her. I've had many friends tell me that. Okay, mine wasn't crazy. But uh, when the camera's off, come talk to me. I'll tell you some stories. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. But this is the deal. Paul addressed the fathers here because the fathers were the unquestioned head of the household in Roman society. Uh, if you've been here for our study on First Peter on Wednesday nights, you've heard some of this already. But the father, as I said, was the unquestioned head of the family. Everyone else did what the father wanted done. Okay? It didn't matter what it was. If the father wanted you to worship a snake, you worshiped a snake. If the father wanted you to only talk to certain friends, you only talked to those certain friends. And if you disobeyed, okay, you could disown kids back in the Roman Empire. And so, so kids, kids were careful, all right? If, if, if your parents wanted you to learn a certain way and get a certain education, you had to learn, or dad wanted you to do that, you would get that. Um, everything happened in a Roman household on the authority of the father. And so that's why Paul here is addressing the fathers. It's not that there weren't some homes that some women had more authority in them than the normal role in Roman society, but for the most part, the society was a male-dominated household with the man in charge of everything. And, uh, and, so, and so the father handled discipline in the house, and so Paul is addressing the father here. But I think that if Paul were to be writing to the church today, if he were to be speaking to us today, that he wouldn't just address the fathers because we're in a different situation. We're in a different culture. So many places, so many households, we have fathers who have either just abandoned their families or have no place in their families, and so the mother has become the father. And so I think if we were to look at this today, if Paul were writing this today, he would address this to parents rather than just the father. And so moving forward with that thought, um, I just want you to think of Paul giving specific instructions to parents here. And the first thing that he says is, parents, fathers, do not exasperate your children. All right, exasperate means to infuriate, to make angry, or to tick off. All right, parents, it should not be your goal, it should not be your purpose to infuriate, make mad, and tick off your children. That's a sin. And uh, I know that kids are sitting here going, oh, it's a sin for them to make me mad. Man, next time mom says something I don't like and she ticks me off, I'm going to let her know to her face that she is sinning to me. You know, right? I mean, I can see your wheels spinning out there, okay? And th that's not what he is saying here. He is talking about them doing things to you that have malice behind them, that their goal and hope in doing them is to make you angry. Many times when the parents say no to something you want or something you don't want, it's for a reason. It's not to make you mad. It's usually for your good, for your protection, or your help. Sometimes it's just not practical. Sometimes, guess what? They just don't have the money and can't afford it, okay? It's not because they hate you. It's just that they can't justify spending $1,500 on that item for you when they're struggling to pay the mortgage and the light bill. But parents, if you do you tell your kids no, just make sure that you're not doing it just to tick them off, but that you're doing it for a reason, that you have justification behind the no. But that's not the only way that parents can make their kids mad. And I don't know if there's anyone in here like this. I've just been told stories by teenagers in my years of youth ministry. Some parents, like this one kid told me about how they would go and their mom or dad would tell them that they had to clean their room. And they would go in and they would clean their room up. And they would get it all clean and they would show it to their parents. And then either their mom or their dad would come in there, grab all their dresser drawers, throw all their clothes on the floor and say, you didn't clean your room. Okay? That is sin. That is not right. That is not biblical. That is not something that Jesus wants from a parent. Because you can crush your kids with those actions. It's a problem that Jesus has called sin, and more importantly, it messes up and hurts our relationship with our kids. Now, I would like to address the other extreme. Some parents never tell their kids no because they throw a fit, have a tantrum, and the kids make their lives miserable. If you're telling your kids yes all the time, to avoid them getting mad, and you think that this verse justifies what you're doing, it does not, okay? When we do that, when we say yes to keep our kids happy, we create a self-centered, spoiled brat. 
that's not what Jesus wants of our kids either. Okay, you see, when we do that, we create a child that can only get along, that can only operate in a system where everything revolves around them. And then when you take that child and you try to throw them out into a world that doesn't give a rip about them, it creates all kinds of adjustment issues. The child can't function, and a lot of times it leads to a disaster in that kid's life. You're not doing your kids any favors by always saying yes to them. They've got to learn to hear the word no and adjust because in life they're going to be told no. And that teaches them something, which is now the second part of Paul's command to us here in the verse. The second thing that Paul says to parents in this section uh, is that we are to bring our kids up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. All right, we're going to have a little real talk here. Um, Parents, it's your job to train and instruct your kids about Jesus. That's what this is telling us. The church is not here to train your kids in how to walk in faith in Jesus. The church is here as a supplement to what you are doing at home. It's your job, parents, to train your kids. That means at home, parents, we should be reading our Bibles with our kids. We should be teaching them about who Jesus is and what he has done for them. Okay? And you may be thinking to yourself, man, I don't know enough about the Bible to teach my kid. Your child is 8, 9, 10 years old. They're not going to ask you what's your stance on infralapsarianism or supralapsarianism. Okay? They are not. And most of you don't even know what I just said. It was one of the dumbest debates I've ever had in my life in a theology class in seminary. Nobody cares about this. But yet in seminary, they'll sit and discuss that junk for hours. And it's just like, kids aren't going to ask that question. They're not going to say at seven years old, explain to me the problem of evil. Okay? They just want to know the basics and the foundations of the truth of God. And if you're a follower of Jesus and you've been spending time with your Bible, guess what? You know the basics. You know the foundation. You know the truth. And you can teach it to them. It doesn't take a seminary degree. And when it comes to talking to our kids and talking to anybody really about Jesus, actually Jesus made us a promise in John 14, 26. He told us this. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Jesus is going to be there to help us. The Holy Spirit is going to be there to help us in those times that we are talking to our kids, okay? He'll be there. He'll lead us. He'll guide us. And guess what? The answer, I don't know, let me find out and get back to you, is a perfectly acceptable answer, okay? None of us have all the answers. We need to be able to say to our kids, you know what, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Let me see if I can find something out and get back to you. You can use that with any adult. We don't have to be the experts and know it all on the Bible in order to teach anyone about Jesus. The second thing I would say that it's not so much about knowing the Bible as much as it is about living and modeling Jesus in front of your kids. See, to be honest, this is where most of the breakdowns occur in families when it comes to kids walking with Jesus. So I'm just prepared to tick people off here. But see, parents hope that taking their kids to church will help overcome the horrible example that they have set as to what it looks like to walk with Jesus. That never works. If us as parents are setting a horrible example of what it means to walk with Jesus, then most likely that's the direction our kids are going to go. If we are setting a mediocre example, that's most likely the direction that our kids are going to follow in. Okay, parents, if we want our kids to follow Jesus, we need to be the example of what this looks like. We teach them and instruct them through our example. If they never see us pray, they're probably not going to pray. If they never see us reading our Bible, we're probably, they're probably not going to read their Bible. If we treat church as something that's not that important, that we only come when we have time, when we don't have something better to do, or when we're not tired, then our kids are not going to be at church either. 
Whatever you prioritize in your life, your kids are going to prioritize that too. And so if going to the beach has a priority over Jesus in your life, that's what your kids are going to grow up to have and be. I mean, I've had this happen to me more times than I can count in my years of youth ministry, uh, this exact situation. The kids, they get into middle and high school, and the, the parents, they got to get a good education. they got to get an education. And so the child misses church all the time because they're studying. You know, well, I've got to study. I gotta su- they had to study. They couldn't be here today. Then their kid goes off to college where they're no longer in the parent's house, and suddenly the kid never shows up at church, and the parent is beside themselves. I set such a good example. No, you didn't. You prioritized education all of their middle and high school years, and now that they are living out that education, you are frustrated and mad. You've got to set the example. Our kids know. We don't want to hear that you've got homework on a Wednesday night. It don't matter. You'll be staying up late and doing it. You're going to be at church because we want to set an example that being in the house of God, spending time with the people of God, worshiping, all of those things are more important because a higher GPA or an eternity in hell, which is better? Live out the example before your kids. So how do we conclude this morning's message in our series? The first thing is, in the parent-child relationship, if we want that to work, kids, you have got to take part of the responsibility in the relationship, okay? You need to honor and obey your parents. Because when you do that, things are going to go well for you. I hate to tell you that, but that's how you get things to go well in your life. Honor and obey your parents. Parents, we need to live and model the life to teach our kids who Jesus is. We don't make them mad on purpose. We model, we live the life that Jesus has called us to live. And see, when we do that in our house, Our relationships between children and parents increases, the the, the quality of it increases so dramatically. It increases so dramatically. Because suddenly you guys are thinking about each other. That was the theme through this whole message or through this whole series was think about others first. And when we're in the parent-child relationship, we're thinking about others first. Kids, we're thinking, I need to honor my parents. Parents, we're thinking, you know what? I don't need to make my children mad, and I need to set a good example for them. And as we do that, once again, we see the relationship grow and blossom and be healthy rather than dysfunctional, disorganized, and a mess. That's what God wants in our relationships. He wants them to be like that, that are healthy, that are life-giving, that brings strength and purpose to our lives rather than bringing frustration and anger to our lives. But we have to play our part. I really hope you enjoyed that message from our series, Homefront. If you did, please click the like button below and let us know. And if you have any questions about anything here at Fam Church, you can go out to myfamchurch.com and check us out there. And thank you once again for joining us online at Fam Church. <laughs>